If you want to become a software engineer in 2026, here's exactly what you need to do. Now, the market recently has changed, right? There's more competition. We've got AI tools. There's been mass layoffs. We have automation and outsourcing. And I'm not going to lie, it has been tough. It's a big change. And a lot of people don't know how to deal with it. Still, though, engineers are in huge demand especially those that actually know what they're doing and that have the right approach to get hired. Now, what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to break down the exact steps, resources, and mistakes to avoid to go from zero experience to an 150K per year job. First things first, you need to just start. Now, the hardest part of becoming a software engineer, especially in 2026, is landing your first job or first internship. Once you get one, everything gets significantly easier because you finally have the experience that people are looking for. It's kind of that catch 22, right? You need experience to get experience, but you can't get experience unless you have experience. And it's just this big mess. So once you get that first bit of experience, you're golden, things get significantly easier. It's like hitting that first 100K when you're investing, you need to get to it as soon as you possibly can and do everything to get there. Okay, so with that in mind, how do you get some experience so that you can get that first experience? Now you need to start with anything related to software engineering. So this could be freelance gigs, university research, volunteering for a local startup, working for the government, doing some you know internship that's like free for a few months, whatever, right? Anything at all that shows that you have some experience in software engineering is better than nothing. And trust me, you need something. So don't be picky at the start. You just need to do something so you can get that kind of first little bit that you can add to your resume so you can have a little bit of leverage to get that first real legitimate software engineering job. For example, you could have an internship at the government of Canada that you got during school where you get paid, you know, $26 an hour Canadian. It's boring work. It's not something that, you know, you want to talk about or do for the rest of your life, but it's that critical first bit of experience that could lead you towards that legitimate job. You could, for example, do some research during university. You could work as a TA during school, right? Any of these things are going to show that, first of all, you have passion for the field and you're building that critical kind of little bit of first experience so that you can then get that first legitimate job and then really accelerate from there. So the lesson here is that your first job or first bit of experience doesn't have to be glamorous. It just has to get you in the door. So do anything you possibly can to build that up, especially while you're still in school or while you're early in your career, because it really will be exponential from there. Next thing that you need to do here is move towards project based learning as fast as possible. You need to stop passively consuming tutorials and make sure that you're actively building something, okay? So building small real world projects to learn the languages and frameworks that you need for the job is always going to outweigh sitting through hours of lectures or watching a bunch of random videos or even reading a programming book. For example, when I was just starting out, one of the first notable projects that I built was a Flappy Bird clone. So I started by building the game that helped me learn about object oriented programming, learn how to build a larger kind of structured Python project. Then I added an AI to the game. This helped me learn about something called Neat, Neuroevolution of Augmented topologies and this was a great project that I actually talked about during my Microsoft interviews that was really engaging and interesting and was unique and something that they hadn't seen done a million times before. So it doesn't need to be a super complicated project but every project that you work on should be used to master one core concept or one core skill. So I built the Flappy Bird project because eventually I wanted to add the AI to it and I wanted to learn kind of how this evolutionary algorithm worked so that's why I built that project. But if you want to build a web app for example maybe you build a Twitter clone or an Instagram clone or your own social media platform, you're doing that to learn about APIs, databases, web application architecture, you get the idea. So a good goal that you can set for yourself in this section here when we're talking about project based learning is within three to four months, have two to three portfolio ready projects that not only show initiative, but that help you learn and master a particular skill. So now I want to dive into your niche and your tech stack. Now in 2026, it's extremely important that you're specialized in one particular area. Being a generalized developer isn't really going to help you land a job and the more specialized you are in say Python or JavaScript or front end or AI or data engineering, whatever it is, the better off you're going to be. Now, I personally recommend that if you're a complete beginner and you're just starting out, that you go for one of the most popular stacks out there, which is going to be a JavaScript heavy stack. Now, for the front end, I'm going to recommend that you learn React. This is fast. It's universally used. It's very interview friendly. And then for the back end, you either use Node.js, which sticks with that JavaScript environment, or you learn something like Spring Boot with Java. 
These are just well-known, extremely popular stacks that are very solid that a lot of companies use that's going to give you the highest chance of landing a job. If you don't like these stacks or you're already using a different stack, that's totally fine. The important thing is that you stay specialized into one area. So while you can mess around and learn as much as you want, don't go learning Go and then learn Rust and then do PHP and then do C++. That's just a recipe for disaster. You're not going to be good at any of them. And it's going to be very difficult to demonstrate your niche expertise. So whatever you do, try to brand yourself as an expert in one particular area. This is the stack that I recommend because it's very beginner friendly. But if you want to go with something else, totally fine. Just make sure you stick with it and that you pitch yourself as like a back end developer or a front end developer or an AI engineer, whatever, doesn't matter, but you need a specialty. Now, if you were going to go with this stack, for example, a project that I could recommend to you that would look great on your resume is something like a Premier League fantasy app, right? Something that's pretty globally recognizable. You could use React for the front end, you could use Spring Boot for the back end, you could connect it with the database, and then you could deploy it with some cloud features, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, another great thing about this project is it's very extensible. So you could add a simple AI feature where you're going to predict, you know, the score of a match or something like that. Now, in 2026, cloud skills are something that's going to separate separate beginners from job ready candidates. A lot of people's profiles that I look at, they have one of these kind of niche stacks, right? They know, for example, React and Spring Boot, or they know Go, or they know some other stack, right? However, they're missing a lot of those cloud skills, which are really a lot more intermediate for people that have actually done something and deployed something in the real world. So make sure that you don't skip learning those. And I'm going to go over a few of them here. So for example, learning like AWS, right? Learning about Kubernetes, learning about Docker, going through something like the AWS. AWS Cloud Practitioner Essentials. This is a free course hosted by AWS is really going to make you stand out and learning the various cloud services allows you to present yourself as a developer who actually knows what happens when you get into the real world. Okay, so CI and CD, GitHub Actions, automated testing, all of these things that actually involve you pushing software out for real users to use is a very valuable skill. And I recommend that regardless of what stack you learn, you add some of these cloud skills to your profile. And specifically, I would recommend targeting AWS for a lot of those cloud services, just because that's something that a lot of recruiters look for and that most companies are using. All right, so now I want to dive a little bit more specifically into your portfolio. Now, like we talked about, you want to aim to have two or three really solid portfolio projects. And from this side of things, I want to talk about how you can present them and things that are going to make those stand out. So first of all, make sure that whatever project you have is easy for someone to access. So a simple link, right, where you can go view it on a website, that's the best way to deploy and show a portfolio project. Now, in this project, you want to have real code. You want to have real design. It should actually work. If it requires someone to sign in, you should have a demo account, for example. And you want to build projects that solve real problems, right? Not just a clone of a tutorial. So I talked about that, you know, Premiere app before. That's cool. That's something interesting. But if you want to solve more of a legitimate problem, you could build an app that schedules exams or manages tasks for students, right? Back when I was starting out, I built a project that automatically created calendars for groups at a summer camp that I was working for. For. So the admin staff didn't need to sit there and look at all these conflicting issues and see if they could schedule multiple groups at the same time. I just built an automatic piece of software that did it for them. Not something super fancy, but it solved a real legitimate problem. And it's something I talked about a ton in a lot of interviews that I had. Now, a bonus here is that you want to build projects that have real users. If you have like 100 people using your application, that is going to stand out massively. And I can tell you all the people I know that got really big tech jobs, they did something like this. They built their own project or their own product. They treated it like a startup. They tried to get as many users as they could. And even if it failed or even if it didn't make any money, it was something that taught them a ton and stood out massively in interviews because they had all this different experience that you just won't have if you've only built something that you used for yourself. Now, the lesson here is that recruiters and hiring managers are hiring based on proof, not based on potential. You need to prove that you actually know what you're doing and they need to be certain that you are a safe hire. Okay, so let's keep going here and talk about applying. Now you can do all of this stuff, but it doesn't matter if you have the wrong strategy when you're applying to jobs. Now overall, applying is a numbers game. You need to have volume plus precision, okay? So yes, you do need to do a lot of volume here, but you can do it intelligently by being precise with where you're targeting that volume. So first of all, stop only applying on LinkedIn. 
Okay, LinkedIn is great, but you need to use it intelligently. So you should reach out to recruiters individually by actually sending them messages. You should try to find the hiring managers. You should go directly to company portals. You should actually network with people that you know that potentially actually work at these companies and ask them for referrals. I've talked a lot about this in other videos, so I'm not going to belabor the point here. But the thing is, you need to do a lot of volume where you're actively searching for the job. You can't just be spraying and praying and sending out hundreds of applications. You might get lucky, but you want to be precise and you want to be targeted in your approach. Rather than spending three hours filling out applications, spend that time reaching out to people directly on LinkedIn reaching out to people in your network, joining you know, a Discord community or Facebook group. I actually know someone, one of the first developers I worked with, they got a job through Facebook Marketplace. Someone was looking for a developer, they pitched themselves for that job, they did like a freelance gig and then they got a full-time position. That can happen and the reason it happened is because they were being active in their search. So let's assume that you've followed all of that advice, you've gone through all of those steps. What I wanna talk about now is interview prep. If you get an opportunity, how do you make sure that you're as prepared as possible? Now, first of all, you need to focus on what companies are actually going to test for. Now, I'm going to give you a general list here, but if you get an interview at a company, do some research. Go online, look on Glassdoor, for example, look on uh, you know, forums like Blind, see what questions have been asked there in the past, what different employees are saying about that company. Look at their mission statement, their values, the tech stack that they're using, other job positions they have available. The more contextually relevant information you have, the better you're going to be able to prepare. You always have to put yourself in the mindset of the employer. If you were hiring for this role, what would you be testing for? What would you wanna see from a candidate? And then you need to come in there and demonstrate those skills. So keep that in mind, you know, always this is company specific, but generally speaking, this is what you can expect and you can start preparing for early. Now first, data structures and algorithms, right? It's very common that at least in one of your interviews, you're probably gonna get asked some type of algorithm style problem where you need to reverse a linked list or traverse a binary tree or something along those lines, right? So for this, you can use platforms like LeetCode or NeatCode, also ones like Algo Expert, for example, and you can start doing a bunch of those questions so you're kind of in the habit of how to answer those. Next, system design basics. Now, especially as you get to that mid and uh, you know higher level, you're always gonna be asked some type of architectural or system design question. So you need to learn how to think at scale. How is the decision you make today going to affect people in the future? And how can your application handle you know, thousands, sometimes millions of users? Now, you don't need to be an expert here, but learning about things like UML class diagrams, entity relationships, and the basics of distributed system design is really important. And it's gonna help you stand out a lot, especially if you are still at that entry level. Again, in entry level interviews, it's gonna be more basic system design questions, but the basics here are really important and you need to look into them. Now, after that, you're also gonna be tested on your behavioral fit. So this is essentially how well do you answer those common questions like tell me about yourself, tell me about a time you dealt with conflict, what's your biggest strength, what's your biggest weakness, and then things like the company principles. So for example, if you're interviewing at Amazon, they're really big about the principles that they have there. In your answers, they want to see you embodying those principles, so you need to know them before you go into the interview. Now, of course, this is where you can implement things like the STAR method, which is very popular. And overall, this isn't super hard to do well at, but you need to practice and you need to rehearse those common questions. Now, it's also common in 2026, especially at mid or smaller sized companies to get given practical interviews. That's where you'll actually get asked a legitimate software engineering problem, not one of these more abstract algorithm or data structure style problems where they may say something like, build me a React component that can paginate through you know, hundreds of results. You may get asked to actually go into an existing code base, read through the code and you'll know, figure out where a bug is. That's something that's very possible. So for those types of interviews, you need to make sure that you're actively writing code, that you're fluent with the programming language that you're gonna be interviewing in, and more importantly, you're practicing your communication and your collaboration. Now, in terms of preparing for this, in terms of things like the leak code, I recommend doing the blind 75. Don't just do 500 random problems or all the easy ones. Go through those because those are very common to appear and practice explaining your thinking out loud. Communication is almost always the reason why people fail these interviews. If you communicate extremely well, you're always gonna give yourself a leg up. And even if you don't ace the technical side of things, you'll always get extra points because people value others that can communicate well. This means that when you're practicing, you need to actually practice like you play talk out loud, have a friend sit in front of you while you're doing a coding interview, explain to them what it is that you're about to be doing. 
when I aced my Microsoft interviews, and this was actually the first technical interview I had, the reason I did so well is because prior I had bought a whiteboard, I had practiced writing all of my solutions on the whiteboard and speaking out loud every single time. I had done that 20 or 30 times, so I, when I was in the interview environment, I was ready, I was super comfortable, and I had done it so much that it just felt natural. Now, the last major point that I want to go over here is ownership. So your biggest edge is going to be your proof of ownership and your creativity. Now, big tech loves entrepreneurs. They love people that go out of their way to build something and actually are obsessed with users, you know, get people on their products, build things, fail, ship stuff out, iterate. That's what big tech really, really loves. Now, that may not be the same for smaller companies, but if you're going for like a Google type role, one of the best ways to get there is to try to build your own startup. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, raising millions of dollars and spending, you know, tens of thousands of hours writing a code base, but even building something simple where you get 100 users or 500 users or 1,000 users, that's massive. That's going to make you stand out. And the important thing here is that it's going to show that you have leadership skills, that you have product management skills, that you've worked with customers that you've received feedback, something that most developers never do because they're only ever working for a job. So if you can build anything on your own and take ownership of that and speak about it because you've actually worked on it, you're just really going to stand out massively because you've solved all of these real world problems. They're going to echo similar things to what you'll receive on the job. I know for me, one of the reasons why the big tech companies that interviewed me really liked my profile was because I was an entrepreneur. I was running a large YouTube channel. I'd built all kinds of products and projects that people had actually used. And I had a lot of great stories to talk about in the interview, not just random tutorial cloned projects that, you know, I made just for this job. Now to wrap it up here, 2026 is is going to reward the developers who build real projects, learn fast and self-teach themselves, understand cloud and AI tools, apply relentlessly but with precision, and communicate well and show ownership. You don't need to be a genius, you just need to be consistent and curious. In fact, some of the best developers I know are not the smartest ones, and that's because they don't have that ego and they always go out of the way to make sure they're improving themselves and learning every single day. If you follow the guidance in this video, I guarantee that this is going to lead you one step closer to your next tech job. I hope you enjoyed the video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one.